off the bow rail before it disappeared into the water. Before he could even begin to deal with that, the fish spurted again and came back around to starboard and resurfaced ten feet from the boat. Gannon blinked sweat out of his stinging eyes, and then whistled as he got a good look at it. He'd caught bigger sailfish before, but this was no contest, the biggest white marlin he had ever hooked. He was piecing together how to bring the monster around to the boat's port side diving door, when it suddenly twisted and went back under. That was when Gannon dropped the rod altogether. The reel clattered against the deck as he grabbed up the thick monofilament line with his gloved hands and began tugging the huge fish in hand over hand. He had it just off the hull, holding the banjo-tight line firmly with his left hand, and was kneeling down on the deck lifting the gaff with his right, when he felt it give one more mighty thrashing spasm. No! Gannon screamed out as the frenzying line gave a funny jerk and the weight suddenly and completely disappeared on him. He groaned as he stood and lunged over the gunwale with the gaff. But the huge fish was already gone. Gannon watched brokenhearted as its immense, beautiful tail, already ten feet deep and counting, waved bye-bye down in the clear water as it dived. Spit the hook a foot away. Gannon thought in agony as he slammed the gaff down loudly against the deck. He glanced forward at the jagged, now useless piece of metal clamped to the bow rail that used to be his radio antenna. After busting up his boat, he lifted the sea rod and reeled in nothing and shook his head in furious disgust as he stared at the empty hooks. Fish one, Gannon less than Zippo, he said, and after a moment began laughing as he looked for a towel. He'd been a fisherman all his life, and it was either that or weep, he knew. Two. The sunset sky was glowing like a sheet of gold leaf by the time Gannon reeled in everything and got all the gear and tackle packed up and stowed tight. After he washed up in the head, he went back up into the flying bridge and set the GPS for Cooperstown and Little Abaco to the south. Cooperstown was actually a little out of his way as he lived farther south and east out on Eleuthera Island. But with the radio antenna, MIA, he wanted to be near shore by the time it got too dark. He slipped his face shield up and his Costa polarized shades on and opened the boat wide to about 30 knots. Through the breeze, the sky began to lose its glow, and the endless plain of water took on the dark metallic tone of tarnished silver. Even for a Monday, the fishing lanes northwest of the Bahamas were deader than normal, the horizon empty in every direction. In fact, the only other vessel he got a glimpse of all day was a faint outline of a container heading west to Florida that morning when he started out. His thoughts drifted to dinner. There was leftover lasagna in his fridge that he could nuke, instead of fresh grilled swordfish, he thought, shaking his defeated head in the rush of the wind. Oh, well. At least the beers would be cold. It was about fifteen miles due east of Cooperstown when he saw something low in the sky off in front of the boat. He thought it was just a shine of light off a cloud, but then he saw that the light was moving, and he jacked up his shades onto his forehead, cupping his hands above his eyes. Out from the postcard Caribbean gold of the sky to the left came a plane, a small corporate jet plane sleek and shiny and pale white. He watched it coming steadily due west at a right angle to the bow. He gauged it to be about four miles to the south. It seemed to be flying quite low. He waited for it to pull up, but it didn't. It kept zipping westward going fast, low and straight as a line drive. He eased off the throttle and grabbed his binoculars, putting his elbows up on the console to steady the view. Then he thumbed in the focus and something in the pit of his stomach went cold. The plane was too low, flying maybe a hundred feet off the deck. It was also going way too fast like a stunt jet plane at an air show. It almost looked like a guided cruise missile rocketing just above the surface of the water. Where had it come from? Gannon wondered, turning at the waist to keep it in the glass. There weren't any airports to the east. Hell, there wasn't anything east of the Bahamas. Maybe it had just left out of Marsh Harbor Airport? It was directly off the front of his bow when he realized 
he couldn't hear its engines.